Good afternoon, everybody, and you are all so welcome to Tell for FET this afternoon. Some of you may have logged in a little early, so thank you for bearing with us as we did a bit of a tech check. So what we are doing this afternoon is we are going to have a look at some of the really creative and innovative practices that have been happening across all of our ETBs. So many of you submitted different pieces to us and we're just showing just a few of those today. So what we're going to do is we're going to show you and start off with some educators professional practice first and then we're going to complete the session with a discussion with Leo Casey and NCI with a few of the participants on a level seven course in technology enhanced learning. So first of all, we are delighted to bring you um, a, a recording of three is the magic number. Three is the magic number is where Marie Tattle and Tara Robinson from Limerick Clare ETB are going to show us how we can get all of our ducks in a row for the next academic year. They're going to tell us why three is the magic number when it comes to tell professional development. And you can see this and more of the different projects on our FETFest YouTube channel. So let's get started with Marie and Tara. An informal space on Teams where all FET staff can find resources and ideas to build their tell skills. The second is show and tell. These are structured but non-formal sessions led by FET practitioners and designed to showcase good ideas around tell. The third is our online teaching and learning course, a fully online but self-paced program designed to provide learning practitioners with the key pedagogical and safe practice skills to effectively deliver emergency remote teaching and learning. Hi, my name is Marie. Let me introduce you to our first resource, which we call the Learning Zone. The Learning Zone is a team created on the Microsoft Teams platform. It's open to all of our staff to join and we currently have almost 500 active members. It was chosen to be the one central location for all things TEL related and to cut down on the confusion of trying to find things in different places. The purpose of the Learning Zone is to provide TEL help and support for our staff and our teaching staff in particular. Staff can come here to join live training events, or watch them back later in their own time. They can book one-to-one -one clinics with the TEL support service, or they can ask questions in the relevant channel about the technology they're using. Tara and I, along with the TEL and PD teams, pose notifications of updates to software and information about upcoming training events that staff can attend. I can sum it up by saying, it's a one-stop shop for all things TEL related. It has also become something we did not expect, a community of practice where colleagues help each other by sharing resources and ideas too. Let's go have a look. This is the TEL Learning Zone. As you can see, it's divided up into a number of channels. Right now we're in the general channel where most of our posts about upcoming events are made. And you can see this one's most recent post is about FedFest. The Teams channel hosts all the kinds of queries that people have in using Microsoft Teams and has answers posted by other members of the community or by ourselves. Moodle likewise is a support service for everyone using our Moodle site to deliver online teaching and learning. Show and tell, we'll be coming onto that one soon. That's all about our recorded short informal training sessions. But tell clinics is where people can book a spot to request a clinic with a member of the TEL staff. Show and Tell is a series of practitioner-led drop-in sessions which take place online. 
These are focused on sharing experiences and or demonstrating use of digital tools for teaching and learning. These short sessions provide a space where FET practitioners can hear from their peers about how they went about using a particular tool or piece of technology with learners, finding out what worked, what worked well or not. Inputs last about 20 minutes with 10 minutes for participants get a chance to ask questions. We record all of our sessions for watch back on our stream channel. Show and tell sessions are drop in and take place every Tuesday and Thursday from 1 to 1.30 on the show and tell channel in our tell learning zone on Teams. To date, we've had more than 20 show and tell sessions on a range of topics from managing class recordings in Teams to video recording tips for skills demos. The PD and TEL support services work to identify and support presenters. We have guidelines on the format of show and tell and presenters have the option of pre-recording their session or doing it live. Here are some really short snippets from show and tell just to give you an idea of what it looks like. Very glad to be here today um, in the Self Access Learning Hub, the old Self Access Centre in O'Connell Avenue, in the Fed Centre on O'Connell Avenue. Something we've developed over the last number of years has been the 12 apps of Christmas. There is an inbuilt mic in, to, in your laptop and in your phone and generally they're for like general purpose mics and if you are not too far away from your device click on staff connect and then we click on the FET division and down on the left hand side we're going to scroll down and we're going to select Moodle. Okay We've had some great feedback on show and tell and the usefulness of the content. We've had a reach of more than 1000 people between live attendance and watchbacks. People really enjoy the format. They like that it is drop in and short in duration. Show and tell is something that we will definitely continue with in the future. The teaching and learning online course was developed by the TEL and PD teams in response to our teaching staff moving to emergency remote teaching in 2020. It takes about 18 to 30 hours to complete and covers the fundamentals from pedagogy to online models and methods to safety and staff platform supports. Once our teaching staff complete the course, they are awarded a digital badge. So far, over 200 of our teaching staff have completed the course and the course feedback has been overwhelmingly positive with 90% happy to recommend it to a colleague or friend. Go on a quick virtual tour. Welcome to Teaching and Learning Online. This is what the course looks like and where it lives on a platform called Easy Generator, which is a content creation tool. As you can see, there are a series of modules in this course. If I scroll down, you can see them, all of them. Let's take a dip into one of these. I'm going to go into module two. So each module begins the same way with a clear learning objective, followed by a series of topics. As you can see, if I scroll on the left, I can find all of those different topics for me to explore. Let's have a look at online teaching methods and the flipped classroom. This is a typical lesson on the course. There is some text to read, and there's very often a video to watch. So you see how they're in the same family. What if you took the traditional school day and flipped it on its head? We also have knowledge checks, just to check in with people to see that they understand the content and following the progress of the course. And as you can see, each section asks you to answer a number of questions correctly, with an overall completion rate of 80% required to pass the course. We're currently working on that we can share with all of our ETB colleagues. To sum up, our advice is this. Line up your digital ducks now for next semester. One duck to be the one stop shop for all your information and supports. Another duck for short informal learning experiences on an ongoing basis, like our show and tells. And the third more formal duck for a badge professional development course. We can get you started there as we're happy to share 
our teaching and learning online course with other ETBs. Thanks for joining us today. We hope we have given you some ideas for your ETB to try out over the next autumn. Brilliant to hear from um, both Tara and Marie there, and always lovely to hear that other ETBs are happy to share um, so that we can continue in this collaborative process that we're engaging in this week. In our next section, we are going to be introduced to Michael Downs. Michael is from Galway Roscommon ETB. He also studied the Level 7 course in Technology Enhanced Learning in NCI, and as part of this short section, Michael is going to share some of his tips for making the learning life of apprentices easier. The typical profile of my students would be um, there. Most of them would have their leaving cert. Some would have a junior cert, and um, typically, it's I, I have an all male class. They're well able to use their mobile phones, of course, but uh, sometimes with computers and laptops, they have to, with say, for instance, copy and paste an image onto a Word document and convert it to a PDF or something, that could be challenging. I, I had to sell or, or pitch it to them, you know, that this is going to make your life easier if you engage with Moodle it will give you 24 seven access to learning. At one stage, I realized that a lot of them didn't have PCs at home or didn't have good connectivity at home or laptops. And I ended up with a situation where I needed to provide them with an option whereby they could use just do everything with their mobile phone on the day of the official on, online assessments for CNJ. So I made a little video using Screencast-O-Matic, uh, showing them how to um, use the Moodle app on their phone. And I also use Screencast-O-Matic to make another little video on how to use Office Lens, whereby you could um, scan several images and convert them all into one PDF file on the phone. So therefore, when you went back to your Moodle app on your phone, you could um, get access to those PDF files on the phone and upload them direct into your Moodle app on the phone. So it was, everything was done with the phone. I use a lot of animation because my apprentices, a lot of them are visual learners. And so I recognized a while back that, you know, a lot of these guys, they don't like reading too much paragraphs of text. That's not their learning style. Down through the years, I see the challenges that the lads have with various activities. A lot of them are practical challenges. So I would typically create an animation, create a section in Moodle for that animation. And within that same section, I would also then put in a, a quiz that relates directly to the animation. So I typically put the two up together. And sometimes then I might put something up just to get feedback. Typically, um, you know, when you decide to build uh, an online activity, I suppose you have to gauge what is it the learners need. Where's, where's the challenge for them? Most uh, activities, I would try and get feedback. I use various methods. I used uh, what's called an exit ticket for one. I think I had seven questions in that exit ticket. Uh, one of them questions was, after having watched this video on how to route the string of stairs, how confident are you? Out of the six that filled out the exit ticket, two of them said they were confident, and the four said they were very confident. So that gave me an average uh, out of three of 2.67, which I was very pleased with, because that proved to me that even though I'd spent a lot of time making that innovation and creating that activity and creating everything that was attached to it, including quizzes, that uh, it was worth it. Uh, another piece of important information, by the way, that I got out of that exit ticket was um, I asked them, you know, what's the next animation you'd like me to make? You know, and uh, out of the six that uh, replied to the exit ticket, um, four of them came back with the same request. And I thought, well, this is interesting. They all wanted me to make an animation on how you would fit a door. Four out of six. I thought, well, I know what my next animation is going to be now. Thank you so much to Mike for submitting that particular recording. Next up, we're going to have um, Teresa McGinley. Teresa is the TEL coordinator for Donegal Education and Training Board. 
and Teresa is going to give us a guided tour about on how TEL mentoring has been implemented and embedded in Donegal ETB. Teresa was also a past participant on the NCI Level 7 course. The Technology Enhanced Learning Working Group found that there was a gap between tutors who were embracing TEL and those who had a fear of TEL. In conjunction with H2 Learning, we developed a programme to help support tutors embrace technology in their teaching and learning. The main idea behind the TEL Mentor programme is that we tailor the programmes towards the mentee. So mentees would often come to us with particular questions around technology or questions around the application of the technology in the classroom. So they might have particular learning or teaching or assessment issues that they want to try and get a solution to. For me, the mentoring element of this course was key. My mentor, Alison, she initiated contact, which got over that whole notion in my head of I shouldn't be bothering her with every last little thing. I really enjoy the mentoring. It's an informal process and it helps to build relationships with colleagues and we can both learn from each other. I'm a Woodford tutor in Newswich, Derry Guinea. I teach a practical subject, very hands-on. I try to avoid computers best I can, but last year I had to engage with technology. So then we as mentors will go and develop a program and then we work alongside and in partnership with the mentees and we develop up the technology skills and we develop up ideas for how those technologies can be implemented in the classroom. The support and encouragement I got from her was amazing. And now at the end, I'm much more comfortable using technology in the classroom. It's about being that person that your mentee can call on whenever they want to know how to do something or when something just doesn't go to plan. So the TAIL mentoring programme was a great help and support to me. And with the guidance of a mentor, I was able to set up students in Google Classroom and interact with students and colleagues online. So the great thing is that it's a really safe environment for the mentees to develop their skills. We learn as well as mentors. This course was so worthwhile because of the basic level it was pitched at, the combination of face-to-face -face and online delivery, and also mixing with tutors from other programs that I wouldn't be in contact with. I also try to encourage the mentees to make their lessons more inclusive and accessible through promoting the principles of universal design for learning. And then of course, we're always there uh, to give additional help to the mentees as they progress with their TEL journey. I highly recommend this course for anyone who wants to dip their toes into the deep waters of technology enhanced learning. It's really rewarding to see someone's confidence grow as they become more relaxed and more comfortable with technology enhanced learning. I overcame that fear that I previously associated with TEL and had a few laughs along the way. Thank you so much to Teresa and to Donegal ETB for sharing that TEL mentoring experience. In our next segment, we're going to move to um, our other colleagues. So we're going to go to Mayo Sligo Leitrim ETB and we're going to find out about how Siobhan Magner, uh, Lorraine Devaney and their TEL coordinator Adele Gavin are going to talk us through how they have future proofed new generation apprenticeships using technology enhanced learning. Good afternoon and welcome from ourselves in Mayo Sligo Leitrim Education and Training Board, also known as MSL ETB. We're delighted to be here this afternoon to showcase our sales apprenticeship and how we've integrated UGL into this programme. My name is Siobhan Magner and I'm the National Programme Manager for the Sales Apprenticeship and I'm joined by my two colleagues from MSL ETB, Idel Gavin, our Technology Enhanced Coordinator, and Lorraine Devaney, our e-learning mentor and Moodle Guru.
MSLETB is the only one of 16 education and training boards to date who has had a new apprenticeship validated by, U by QQI using blended learning guidelines. This sales apprenticeship is a post-2016 new generation apprenticeship, which differs in structure from the traditional craft apprenticeship, such as carpentry or plumbing. Is it, a two, it, is, it is a two-year programme leading to a level six qualification, an advanced certificate in sales, and 84% of it is delivered on the job, with the remaining 16% delivered via online and face-to-face -face workshops. Office 365, Microsoft Teams and Moodle are the mainstream technologies used throughout the programme. We have a diverse learner cohort coming from different geographical locations, social, economic and cultural backgrounds, all with different literacy, numeracy and digital abilities. A key component of the programme is the building of staff and learner digital, digital capabilities and therefore our dedicated e-learning mentor is an excellent support to both educators and apprentices. I'll now hand you over to my colleague Adele and she will talk to you about the structure of our online classroom and some of the ways we incorporate UDL into this programme. Thank you Siobhan. On this slide you can see an example of a dedicated Moodle page including the contact details and availability of the instructor. The time of the online class and a direct link to the online class are also here, all in one location and easily accessible for the apprentice. Apprentices take part in a two hour class using asynchronous and synchronous learning. Resources such as links to reading materials, sample multiple choice questions, relevant videos are all available as part of the asynchronous provision. This is followed by a 45 minute synchronous class consisting of at least three activities, culminating in a 20 minute discussion, ensuring that everybody understands the topic with the final five minutes dedicated to their assessment. I'm now going to talk you through some practical examples of how we integrate Universal Design for Learning, UDL, on this programme. Firstly, we will look at multiple means of representation. Learning materials are chunked by breaking it down into bite-sized pieces, making it more manageable for the learner. We make the content interactive and multimodal using video, podcasts, polls, quizzes and so on. We use a flipped classroom approach, as discussed in the previous slide, and provide all learning materials in advance on our Moodle. We provide learners with recordings of guest lectures and a follow-up email is sent out to all apprentices about the key areas covered in the online class. Now we will look at some practical examples of how we integrate multiple means of action and expression. As mentioned by my colleague, the course uses a blended learning approach with a combination of work-based learning, online learning and face-to-face. -face. And this is done using online collaboration tools, multimedia content and digital communications technology. Feedback is very important on this programme and it includes formative, informal and formal feedback. We always endeavour for feedback to be timely, individualised, regular, related to the work presented and as an aid to learning. And finally, we will look at some examples of how we integrate multiple means of engagement. The program commences with a comprehensive week-long induction, where apprentices receive training on Microsoft Teams, Moodle and fundamentals in digital skills. We actively encourage peer-to-peer -peer communication both in and out of the, out of the classroom. We facilitate collaboration using breakout rooms in Teams and by setting up study groups via Teams. Apprentices use Teams groups, a dedicated YouTube channel and their own WhatsApp groups to support each other. Apprentices can also access a bank of digital resources such as the ETBI library and live and recorded webinars with guest speakers and master classes in digital tools, offering many ways to engage with the programme. I'll now hand you back to my colleague Siobhan. Literacy for life is at the heart of what we do. The ultimate goal of literacy instruction is to build learners comprehension, writing skills and overall communication skills. Therefore, we have embedded writing and study skills throughout the programme. 
The National Adult Literacy Agency in 2020 highlighted the importance of investing in adult literacy, numeracy and digital skills. And we are committed to investing in adult literacy and thus creating learners that are confident in using technology as part of this work, study and home life. Roisin Doherty, Director of Inclusion at Solace, highlighted the importance of developing key lifelong learning competencies. So how have we embedded literacy throughout the programme? Each apprentice is invited to take an online literacy assessment before they commence their induction. During the induction week, the adult literacy tutor checks in with them on a one-to-one -one basis and offers supports to them based on their needs. A mandatory one-hour group session is scheduled monthly and this focuses on study skills, basic literacy, research, note-taking, assessments and so on. Another elective hour per month is also scheduled and in addition, the individual can receive tailored one-to-one -one sessions if needed. A YouTube channel has been created by Lorcan, our adult literacy tutor, and this is helpful for revision or just-in-time learning tools. As this set of learners move into their second year of the programme, numeracy will become more important and their needs will be further assessed. Certain traditional apprenticeships, such as electricians, may focus more on numeracy and less on literacy and vice versa. Education and Training Boards Ireland, the representative body for all ETBs, have developed a new digital library resource for the sector. Whilst at its initial stages, it is populated with relevant books, databases, websites, blogs for the sales apprenticeship. It also has a study skills section, which includes short videos and other resources pertaining to writing and study skills. In addition, two new handbooks have been developed in conjunction with a number of ETBs a guide to academic referencing and a guide to academic writing, both of which are available to all apprentices. On sales apprenticeship, we endeavour to apply the principles of UDL in all areas of our teaching and learning. This is an area we, we are continually working to improve. Here are some of our plans. Firstly, to review alternative assessments in order to incorporate learner autonomy and offer choice in how assessments are represented. We also endeavour to further upskill staff in UDL. We plan to provide assistive technology training for all apprentices, which from June will be embedded in the induction programme. And in particular, we will focus on the immersive reader and dictate feature in Office 365. We will also further explore scaffolding tools, for example, mind mapping tools like Coggle for writing activities. This brings us to the end of our presentation. Thank you for taking the time to listen to us and a special word of thanks to our colleagues on the sales apprenticeship team whose work we are showcasing today. Enjoy the rest of this virtual conference. Huge thanks to MSL ETB for sharing with us how they're currently integrating and embedding UDL literacy and numeracy in their apprenticeship programs. Next, we have a, a presentation on learning and technology in prison education by Orla Brennan from the Education Service to Prisons. Orla is a staff member in City of Dublin ETB and she did the level, the level six course this year in NCI. She's going to talk to us about how technologies are slowly being introduced into prison education. Hi, who are you? My name is Orla Brennan. I am the PE and pre-release teacher at Wefield Prison. I've been working there for approximately eight years, going into my ninth year now. Um, I absolutely love my job. I started out in doing cover in further education. So all along I've been doing adult education, which I absolutely love. Um, my role in the prison service as a PE teacher is to educate people as to the importance of physical exercise. So in doing that, I teach QQI level two, three and four. I also um, run a programme called pre-release and what this does is it prepares prisoners, it help, allows them or enables them to put a plan in place for when they when they leave prison. So 
Um, the pre-release program is generally a 10 week program. And what I do is I work alongside my colleague Rose Kerrigan and we get external services in to meet the prisoners. So we would get the likes of housing, employment, education, all in to have chats to our groups. On average, our groups have about approximately, I'd say our max capacity is 15 students. So um, we would have 15 students getting to meet uh, a new service each week. And personally, I think this is so valuable because getting to meet somebody face to face and meet that connection before they get out the gates um, is just so important. So that if they need that person on the other side, they've already made the connection and it's at that little bit easier to make contact. Um, I'm so passionate about helping my students. The students we work with are, it's slightly different in adult education as these have done wrong and are impris imprisoned as a result. The people that come to school are the people that want to change. So my goal is to try help them make those changes and I'm extremely passionate at helping them achieve their goals. Um, there was a funding given to complete the NCI course in Tech and Learning and I put my name forward for that. Um, initially, I was a bit um, apprehensive at doing the course because it was all online and I hadn't do, done many online courses before. It was all classroom based for me. So I put my name forward and I um, definitely so glad I've done that because I have learned so much from the course and the lecture itself, Mike Goldrick, he, his presentation was absolutely phenomenal. He made everything so interesting, so engaging and very easy to learn. And um, the main, there was two main forms of assessment in the course. So assessment one was just a plan, whereas assessment two was your actual um, completing um, using the applications in a classroom based. Unfortunately, because in the prison service with the COVID-19, we hadn't got access to our students. So what I decided to do um, with one of my colleagues was there was CPD week and with the CPD week, the, we got a slot where we could actually teach our colleagues how to use the applications that we've learned about. So um, the application that we chose was uh, Book Creator and ThinkLink. So they're online interactive learning resources. Um, th there was so much positive feedback from this that we decided to run workshops. So from the CPD week, we did a poll using Microsoft Forms. We got brilliant feedback and we realised that, hang on, there's a, there's, um, a need for this in the prison service. So we decided to contact all head teachers. All we had all the head teachers on board. But before we were doing this, we need to know that if these applications are to be used in the prison, that there was no barriers. So what we did was we decided the four students that did the NCI course, we decided to create a tell group and we created an audit for all the classes or all the education centres within the prison to make sure that they had, we had the foundations uh, such as internet in each classroom, fixed projectors, whiteboards, speakers, anything that was necessary for technology to be used within the prison service. So that audit um, just showed areas that where improvement was needed so that the head teachers could then work on getting in those um, whatever whatever areas needed uh, improvement. That's now currently underway in the prison service and we are now um, our tech and learning team. So myself and my three colleagues are now delivering each uh, each week we have a different application. So with the workshops, it's done on three workshops. Workshop one is how we create the application. So if it's a book creator, we show them how show our colleagues how to build a book creator, showing them all the features on the website. Then 
the second workshop is a check in workshop. So it gives um, our colleagues an opportunity to play around with the application and try build it themselves and then come to the second workshop. Any uh, areas that they need help with, we provide them with that on the second workshop. And then on the third workshop, what we do is we get the, our colleagues to present. It's very informal. It's not marked, it's not assessed. It's just to showcase what they've done. Um, and again, so we've gone through out of the four different applications, we've gone through three of them. We still have another one, a uh, Quizlet to showcase. So um, the, th the four of them we're doing is Quizlet, Nearpod, Thinglink and Book Creator. So we've one final one to do, but the feedback has been so positive and teachers are really looking forward to using this in the classroom. Um, going forward, we're hoping to have a tech and learning representative in each unit in the prison service. So there's more teachers going through the NCI course and then hopefully um, in the next coming weeks or months, we'll have a representative in each unit so that they can be the go to when it comes to using the applications in the prison service. Um, Moving with times, technology is huge in education uh, and like that in prison education, we also want to be moving with the times. So it's been a, a big roller coaster like it has been for everybody in this last um, the last year, but we have got some some like really, really positive uh, results out of it. So uh, it's really going strong and we want to continue this. This isn't just short term. This is going to be for the long term. And uh, we have great people behind it, uh, very motivated staff, motivated teachers. So no, I've no doubt that it's going to be um, this is definitely going to continue on for the future. And um, anyway, thanks very much for listening Um, really hope you enjoyed what I had to say. And yeah, that's it for me. Thanks very much. Bye bye. A great presentation there from Orla. Thank you so much for sharing how technology is being embedded in your own practices in the education service to prisons. So next up, we have Cohen Ambrose from Limerick Clare ETB. Cohen is a current student on the level seven course in NCI and Cohen is going to walk us through how self paced micro learning for effect teaching staff professional development has been embedded in his practice. Hi, my name is Cohen Ambrose. I'm a resource worker with Limerick and Clare Education and Training Board. Um, my project uh, analyzed a, 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 a question, what potential uh, do self-paced micro e-learning courses have to provide further education and training teaching staff with the necessary digital and pedagogical skill sets uh, to begin teaching online or blended courses? Um, what I found is that in the literature, there's very little research in this specific area, but several studies did indicate that while teaching staff may prefer face to face sessions, they're actually more likely to opt for asynchronous development programs, which allow them to overcome those uh, scheduling issues typical of traditional CPD initiatives. But the three main um, principles of self paced um, uh, e learning professional development courses that I came across and kind of boiled things down to are that our, our learner autonomy, um, that the participants uh, can engage at, the, at their own, in their own time and at their own pace, that they're in situated formats as in situated cognition, that at the end of the course, they have something that's directly applicable to their teaching practice. And then third, that the more critical self-reflection embedded into the e-learning experience, the better. So my project uh, was to create a course uh, using the e-learning authoring tool, uh, Easy Generator, 
that I had eventually called teaching with Padlet because it taught uh, practitioners how to teach with the EdTech tool Padlet. I made all the video tutorials using Zoom, uh, and I made uh, the reflection options, all the critical self-reflection options were done using Flipgrid. Um, you can access a copy of the review course by clicking uh, that uh, you, uh, or scanning that QR code. Um, but the course itself is broken into five sections. Uh, there's a general overview of what Padlet is. So it started for people that had no idea what Padlet even was and culminated in them actually having a Padlet and an activity ready to go for learners. Um, it then takes them through getting started, logging in essentially, um, then um, making a Padlet, posting on Padlet, uh, then it takes them through two case studies of examples of how other uh, further education and training tutors have taught with Padlet. Um, and then I adapted uh, Dr. Jilly Simon's eTivities framework um, uh, and created a template and asked them to create an eTivity for a Padlet that that they could then use with learners in an active way. So we looked at, active, there's a little intro of active learning theory and suggesting that they use Padlet in a way that learners can actually engage with it. So at the end, they come out with a Padlet made with a, a, an active learning activity ready to go based on some instructional design theory. Um, and then of course, I linked in a Microsoft Forms survey at the end of the final section re requesting that they submit feedback on their overall experience. Um, so uh, you can look at my uh, com the, the result, the full, the complete survey results uh, by scanning that QR code. Um, but my inquiry essentially exposed a number of strengths and weaknesses with the length, interaction, assessment methods, and other user, ex user experience interface of this particular uh, micro learning, micro e-learning experience, but most notably the participants rated the course at 93% uh, for instructiveness, 85% for user experience and accessibility, and they completed the course feeling over 90% either very confident or confident uh, going forward teaching with Padlet. Uh, and given those initial qualitative findings or quantitative findings, I feel pretty good about the inquiry's initial iteration, uh, but you can scan the QR code to the right to view those uh, survey results uh, in full. Um, but uh, essentially, uh, I'm curious, uh, in self-directed and self-guided e-learning modules or training courses, what are the most efficacious means to engaging, motivating, retaining, and finishing participants? Um, what are the best user experience methods to employ to best engage participants? Uh, what are the best interactivity and assessment tools to motivate participants to learn uh, from the course materials at a meaningful level? And these are just a few research questions worth asking in my next stages of, of research into this area. That's great. Super from Cohen. Thank you so much for that. And I particularly love how Cohen has linked that whole importance of reflection for educators to support their own professional learning and development. And I feel we can often um, underestimate how important that is. Next, we will have Ruth Madison. Ruth is from Galway Risk Common ETB, and she is going to share all of the creative and innovative ways that she's using Flipgrid videos with her child care, care class. Ruth is a student also on the NCI Level 7 course. Thanks Ruth Madison. I'm a tutor with Galway and Roscommon ETB and for my FitFest presentation I'm going to share with you my experience in using Flipgrid with my class. Um, I teach a childcare class and um, we've tried out Flipgrid in the last academic year while we've been learning online um, as we've had to all move online due to COVID. So I'm sharing my experiences and I hope that some of um, what I share with you might be useful for you and give you ideas for ways you might use Flipgrid with your class. So I have been doing a course with the National College of Ireland for the last year um, on technology enhanced learning. So that's where I was first introduced to Flipgrid myself as a student. So I had the experience of trying it out um, as part of the course. And then later on, when we had to test out different technologies with our classes, I chose to use Flipgrid with my class. I'm a part time tutor and I teach the level five early childhood care and education course in Gort Further Education and Training Centre. 
So we're a part time class, um, usually evenings, two evenings a week. And my learners um, are in the centre under the Back to Education initiative. So at the time I was running this investigation, I had eight female learners in the class, ranging in age from 24 to 63. So I have a variety of learners. Um, lots of them are um, perhaps working already in childcare and uh, working part time in the day and then are studying in the evening to complete the qualification. I also have learners who may uh, be returning to education and perhaps have young children at home who they're caring for in the daytime. So they're quite busy, um, but they're all quite focused. Um, and although they didn't have huge confidence in using technology when we moved online, they've all got a very positive attitude to trying things out. So um, when we decided to try out Flipgrid, we kind of approached it with a let's give it a go attitude. And um, they all took on the challenge very well. So Flipgrid is a video discussion platform, and I'm sure elsewhere in FECFest there'll be more um, presentations explaining more about um, all the things you can do with Flipgrid. Um, it's easy to access. It was easy for me to set up a Flipgrid group for my class. Um, so I added their student email addresses and I put a join code on. So it's restricted to just our class, so it's not public and um, only we have access to the Flipgrid page. The challenge I had was to try and improve my learner engagement with uh, reflective practice activities. So during the childcare course, there's lots of requirements for my learners to do reflective practice. Um, so in particular, while I was doing this investigation, we had been working on the communications module where they all had to reflect on their mock interview. And they were about to start the work experience module where they had to do their 10 diary uh, reflections from their work placements. So I was trying to find a tool that we could use to perhaps replace the written diary entries and maybe something that would be more engaging for my learners. Um, so perhaps they would get more out of the process of the reflective practice because it's a useful thing for learners to reflect on their progression during the course. But it's also important for the childcare um, course in particular because reflective practice is a, a skill that childcare workers need to have. So that's what we, we tried out with the class. And I'm just going to show you now the, um, the first Flipgrid activity that I set up for my learners to use. So this is the Flipgrid um, page for our very first activity. So I thought to begin with, I would make it very easygoing and relaxed. So it was a very simple activity. So to set up the activity, I recorded a video myself here, which the learners could play. But I also gave an introduction to it here for the learners. The nice thing about Flipgrid is that there's access here to immersive reader. So um, any learners that had difficulty in reading the text could use immersive reader to read the text. Um, and also captions are available um, for the videos too. So it's very accessible to learners, um, it, you know, with all different levels of abilities. So I put up the video for them and um, I just gave them the link to it and they found the link went on to the video and they recorded their own responses. It's really simple for them to do and their responses then are further down the page. And to begin with, I moderated the activity, which meant that I could check their responses first. So in case someone had made a mistake or had recorded something you know, that was a bit embarrassing, there'd be a chance for me to let them know and let them re-record it. Um, so that I think helped them feel at ease doing it for the very first time. So all their responses then were shared on this Flipgrid page and they could all watch and listen to each other's responses. And all I was asking them to do was just to introduce themselves and share a book or a TV recommendation for us to watch during lockdown. So that was how we introduced it. So that way I could check, could everyone use it OK? Um, and were they all familiar with it before I set it as an assessment activity for their reflections for the mock interviews, which I did the following week. And the results were really good and really positive. So what I found was that the whole class did use the Flipgrid uh, video for their reflections. So I had said to them that they had to do it by video, but I was expecting that maybe one or two might have problems and come to me to say they couldn't do it. But in fact, all of them did it. Um, they all did it very quickly. So one of the things I had found before was that um, they would do their skills demonstration. So in this case, the mock interview, but they might not write the reflection and hand it in till quite some weeks afterwards. And then it was really noticeable because um, you could tell they hadn't really remembered what they had felt at the time. So they actually recorded their videos. Most of them did it within half an hour of actually doing the mock interview. And 60% of them actually used their mobile phones to record the videos. 
So that's really important because if I'm asking them to do video diaries and submit them, um, I want to make sure that all of the learners can access that. So even those who aren't able to use, uh, have, don't have access to a laptop at home. So that was really encouraging. And then I asked my learners to give me some feedback. Um, and all these quotes here are directly from the feedback forms that I gave to the group. So um, I enjoyed the simplicity. So that was really important that it was simple and easy to use, because if I was trying to give them a new technology that was complicated or difficult, I think it would have put them off straight away. So the fact that it was very user friendly and easy to use was really positive. Flipgrid allows more freedom in how, where and when I can complete tasks. The accessibility from my phone makes this possible. So as I said, a lot of my learners are very busy. Um, so it was great that they had that flexibility there to complete their reflection wherever they were. I find it much easier to express myself when talking. So a few of my learners don't have English as a first language. And while their written um, assessments are all a very good quality, um, it was good for me to realise that actually they found it easier to express themselves talking. And it's something I'd never really considered before um, that you know, for a reflection, especially, which is very personal, that maybe having a video option would be better for all learners, but in particular, perhaps learners whose, whose second language is English. Um, and I was more prepared to complete the tasks sooner, giving a more honest reply. So that was really nice for me to, to read because um, that's what I was hoping for, that the reflections would be more genuine and from the heart from the learners. So all in all, it was really positive. Um, we've continued to use Flipgrid. I've got it there as an option. So where there's other reflective activities, they don't have to do it as a video diary, but I always give it now as an option. So for those learners who prefer to express themselves um, by talking, it's there for them to choose if they want it. And we also use it for um, kind of more uh, informal activities from week to week because we have missed out on the face to face of classrooms. And in a Zoom online environment, um, there isn't always the same class discussion. So having a space where learners can share videos online has been really useful. It's good for the learners who perhaps are a bit too shy to speak out when we're online in class. Um, and it's good for learners who maybe want to have a bit more time to think about what they're going to say before they, they share something with us. And moving on, I'm going to try and use Flipgrid more myself. Um, I'm now looking at using Flipgrid to share my feedback with learners when they're submitting their work for assessment. So I'm trying to do less feedback by email. We're not in the classroom anymore, so I normally would sit with them one to one and talk over their assignments when they hand them in. So instead, I'm using Flipgrid Shorts where I can screencast and have the learner's assignment up on the screen. And as I'm looking at it on screen, I could be talking about what needs to be done with the assignment. And then I can share that video really easily with the learners just by a link. So I'm trying to use Flipgrid now myself so that I'm doing less um, email feedback and more video feedback. So that's a brief summary then of how I've used Flipgrid with my class and hopefully um, some of you will be inspired to have a go and try yourselves. And that was Ruth. What a fabulous way to engage and empower our learners. If you missed our afternoon or lunchtime session today, we had a surprise visit from Anne Kozma. Flipgrid enthusiast and absolute expert. And in that recorded section, which is on the FETFEST YouTube channel, you'll be able to find out a little bit more about some training or um, PLD activity that you can engage with in the area of using Flipgrid. So definitely worth having a look at that. In our next segment, we're going to introduce you to Avril Tierney. Avril works in the Adult Education Service in the City of Dublin, ETB. And Avril is going to explain to you everything that you need to know about the Level 7 course and what it has meant to her and her teaching this year. Hi everyone, my name is Avril Tierney and I work in the Cabra and Finglas Adult Education Service. And I said I would come on this morning and talk about my experience on the TEL Level 7 at NCI um, over the last few months. Yes, yeah, so I'm teaching at the moment um, in Finglas uh, QQI Level 5 in Social Justice Principles. Um, it's a new course for me and it's been really interesting and fun to teach uh, despite the circumstances. Uh, like everyone, I've been teaching online um, 
it's difficult times, there's lots of challenges as we all know. So um, however, the tell, bringing tell tools in has been a really positive aspect of teaching this year. Um, so designing this new course um, and knowing that I was going to do some tell training, I really wanted to try and integrate some tools from the start. And I had a really strong goal for the course um, and for the, these tools, which was to just to, to make sure I could hear every voice in the classroom. The nature of the topic is very much participatory and everybody giving their opinions and uh, sharing and discussion. So I was aware that there was a variety of different voices and um, some older people in the classroom and some not native English speakers. So I just wanted to make sure there was a space for everyone to speak up and have their say. Um, and really hoping the telltales could enhance this, break down barriers and even create new spaces for learners to engage and speak up that maybe sometimes were less pressure. Um, the TEL course itself is based on three modules. Um, so the first one looks at digital capabilities assessment, looking at the digital skills of your learners and the teachers. And this informs your learning design. Um, so if you know what people are coming in with, you can cater for them individually and maybe their strengths and weaknesses as a group. Um, so you can target areas for improvement and uh, look at where would be a good, good spaces to integrate uh, technology skills and tell into your lesson planning. Uh, the second module then is tell in teaching and learning and that's great for just having really good practice around learning design um, we looked a lot at the daddy model and also at udl so really trying to design our teaching and learning experiences with tell to reach all the learners um, knowing that we when we introduce the tell tool we're really looking at good practice and keeping in mind uh, these principles and systems that we can return to again and again when we're trying out a new tool. And then the third module is looking at tell in assessment, feedback and learning support. And I'm working on that module at the moment. Um, it's fantastic for really opening up your ideas about assessment and ways that it, it can be accessible. Um, trying out new methods. I'm trying out some video assessment at the moment on Flipgrid um, and supporting learners to move forward using the tell tools. Um, so yeah that's that's the course in a nutshell and i'll just give you a little look um oh yeah just my takeaway from the course overall i think apart from all the training was um just the invaluable opportunity it gave to connect with so many adult educators in so many contexts um, every conversation or comment in the chat, every class you went to, every post on a notice board, there's just something to learn uh, from everybody. And everyone is so passionate about their subjects and their um, learners and how they approach their teaching that uh, it really, I suppose, encourages you to be the same and to know that you're this like minded people out there. Uh, so even in this most challenging time of COVID, um, it's actually offered, the course has offered a lot of support and a lot of community, uh, which has been great. Uh, I do feel it's invigorated my practice as well, and I've heard that from a lot of colleagues on the course. Um, you know, despite taking on a level seven in the pandemic, I'm wondering if you're crazy. Uh, the process kind of brought learning alive and it challenges you, but it's also an opportunity to get creative. And even if you're failing, sometimes you're trying things out in partnership with your learners and their feedback is informing your every step. So this is just an example of one of my assignments. Um, so it was for the second modules, teaching and learning uh, with tell tools. Um, so I had a look at Padlet and Nearpod in my classroom. And again, it was coming back to that um, focus of trying to hear all the learners and all the voices. I'm sure many of you can relate to those um, classrooms where some people will really speak up all the time and others will kind of hold back and, you know, they might put a little comment in the chat, but it's hard to get them. And in an online classroom, even more challenging. 
Um, so we set up a Padlet board for the students where they could post on particular topics. Uh, they could write messages to each other or post on each other's comments, and they could post up links to topics that they'd read on social justice principles that were of interest to them. Um, and it, that went really well. The students were really excited to use a new tool, which surprised me across the board. They, they were really open to it. Um, and then in conjunction with my TAMS mentor, we did a Nearpod class as well. And that was a really new tool to me. So I was um, hoping it would go well. I knew it was quite fast paced and with the quizzes and everything, I didn't know if all the students would go for it. Um, but everybody really enjoyed that as well. Um, so luckily for me, my tools went really well. They don't always go well. We we tried a blog at one stage for one of the assignments and that didn't go down well. So. Uh, but it's try, trial and error and it's talking to the learners and listening and looking at your best practice. Um, so it was a great module. And then just on my reflection piece for that module, um, I just posted a little bit about the feedback from the learners and also my student profiles. And this was really just trying to get across that message of all the voices. Um, you know, there's learners there with so much experience and you know, backgrounds and community activisms that have so much to say and young learners coming in, uh, not native to Ireland, you know, getting to grips with the culture and really wanting to get involved and all learners are learning from each other, which was fantastic as well. Um, so that's really it there. Uh, I wanted to just say thanks. Uh, thanks to my AEO Cora for letting me do the course and to Carrie and the CDTB for the opportunity and to my TAMS mentor Geraldine who was really helpful this year and all my colleagues at Cabra and Finglas that have helped out as well. Um, I put up my email if you have any questions and uh, thanks for your time. Brilliant from Avril, thank you so much for sharing that and, and yet another way of looking at things through the adult education service as well as through traineeships and apprenticeships and the FET colleges, youth reach thank everything you. here today. So thank you so much for that. In our next recording and in our final piece that will bring us towards the end, we're going to meet with Leo Casey from NCI, who is the Director of Learning and Teaching and Education Programmes, as well as being the Director in the Centre for Research and Innovation in Learning and Teaching. Leo met with some of the teachers who are current students on the NCI Level 7 course in TEL, which was developed in collaboration with Solus ETBI and NCI. And we want to say our thanks to Dave Mulvaney from CDETB, Neve Deegan from Limerick Clare ETB, and Monica Alvarez from Dublin Dunleary ETB for joining Leo in this roundtable discussion. The Level 7 is one of three courses nationally developed to support FET teachers in the area of learning technologies, digital skills and capabilities and blended learning. And these courses were developed in response to findings from TEL and PD strategies where FET educators identified the need to upskill in the area of using technologies to enhance learning. So this particular course looks at digital capabilities, the learner experience, technologies in teaching and learning and technologies in assessment, feedback and in learning support. So in this, we are going to invite you to join Leo in a roundtable discussion to share how the course has supported these educators and their learners and in how it contributes to supporting innovative practice in their classrooms. Thanks everyone for uh, coming to this session. Um, we're going to talk about the experiences of uh, some of our um, colleagues and students um, on a program about technology enhanced learning specifically for teachers and educators. So um, I have three people here who are going to tell me about their experiences. I'm going to start with Dave. Dave, maybe you could give us a quick introduction about yourself and why you decided to do this course. Um, well, I'm Dave Mulvaney and I work with the City of Dublin ETB. Uh, I've been working with them for the last 10 years in uh, youth reach, in particular in Crumlin youth reach. So I teach maths and IT, biology and beekeeping there. Um, <clears throat> I think it was back in about 2018, I met Carrie 
and she introduced me to technology enhanced learning to the town's mentoring project in the city of Dublin. And uh, following on from completing that, I did the level six in NCI. So the next natural step then for me was to do the level seven, um, just to keep myself up to date with current technology. And, you know, especially because of the way the classroom is transitioning from face to face to virtual, and now we're going into a blended approach. Thanks, Dave. And Monica, maybe you could introduce yourself and why you took on the course. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Monica Alvarez and I'm um, a coordinator of horticulture in Dundrum College of Further Education. Um, I suppose I, I took the course because uh, over the last few years I've come to realise that uh, even though my practice is very uh, hands on, <coughs> experience and practical and all of that, at the same time uh, I realised and recognised the shortfall in in the methodology of teaching and I uh, I felt that there would be a huge benefit uh, to students and to to my own my own method of doing things um, so I um, I also I suppose the pandemic came and I knew I had to prepare myself the best I could so that was a big motivator thank you and Neve, um, maybe you could tell us a bit about yourself and why you did the course. Hi Leo, um, so currently I'm a teacher within a further education and training centre with the Limerick and Clare ETB. So um, I teach like level five business and IT modules as well as um, modules on an apprenticeship programme. My own background is that I've been 17 years within the public service. So I went back as mature learner part time and my degree, believe it or not, about 10 years back was done through a flexi learning online program. So it's an area that I'm very, it's very close to that. We did the full course over the four years online. So I really always had a passion in the area. Currently at the moment, um, I'm a digital champion as part of an initiative that LCE to be have rolled out. It's um, the Tell Support Network Group. So within that, I decided I really wanted a relevant qualification to sit with that area. But more importantly, what I was looking to gain from the course was um, best practice um, to improve my teaching strategy. I felt that when we hit the blended approach, um, you could see it became more evident that to come through your modules, you wanted more and more effective tools to get better learner engagement. Thank you. And Dave, you mentioned earlier like that you'd already done the level six. So even thinking back to that time, what were your expectations before you started the program? And then what were your expectations when you went on to do this level seven uh, course? Um, well, I wasn't too sure. I was I was sure it was going to, to flow from the, the six into the seven. And in certain ways it did. Um, do you know, I was hoping that it would really, but what I was hoping was that it would deepen my knowledge in the technologies and keep me very, keep me very current because I'm constantly striving to improve my own teaching practice. And it's not only for my benefit, but for the benefit of my learners to improve their experience in the classroom and as well as that to improve their digital capabilities. And how did it turn out for you when you did the course? Uh, quite well actually I enjoyed it um, and I'm still enjoying it you know once or twice during the year it did become a bit of a struggle trying to juggle workload and college load um, but I wouldn't discourage anybody else from doing it because I, I couldn't put a value actually on the, you know the amount of people that I've met through this and the amount of contacts I've made across the different ETBs that not only now do I have colleagues in City of Dublin I have colleagues within the ETB in Ireland uh, and just to meet like-minded teachers across the country is brilliant. Thank you. Um, Monica, what were your expectations and thoughts before you started out on the programme? Like Dave, I actually did the level six as well. And really all I thought that I was going to receive just a, a few pointers in the right direction in relation to what apps one, one could use for different um, uh, situations. 
But I was really uh, very impressed by the fact that the course isn't just about a few technologies here and there. It's much more than that. It, it deals with pedagogy. It deals with methods of teaching. It, it deals with assistive technologies, universal design for learning. It's, a whole brand new uh, uh, area that uh, also, I suppose, involves technologies to help and to enhance it. It, it was, I suppose, 90% more than what, what I expected. Um, and um, I suppose in a way like with um, um, trying to do it at the same time as teaching, I thought, well, we're, we're going to try and take advantage of the uh, pieces of work that I had to do for the course and implement those simultaneously. So in my teaching practice, uh, thanks to the, um, the assignments that we were given, I was able to actually put a very realistic touch to this and um, utilize my assignments in order to bring my present students into uh, the equation and the result was great because I, I was not wasting any time of my teaching practice. So it came hand in hand. And yes, I did have to put a lot of thinking to it, but it's something that I can see it will benefit me in years to come. And it's it's still, I mean, people have reported as well elsewhere, you know, it's quite a full on course. Uh, um, and as Dave mentioned, especially when you're teaching at the same time, but what you've mentioned there is that you've managed to integrate some of the insights from the course into your yeah. teaching. Absolutely, because it's the, na the nature of the course itself, uh, it leads itself to do that. And in fact, that's where I find most beneficial is that it's not it's not a course that you do um, that is theoretical and that you put in your imagination at work. No, on the contrary, you um, experience it through your, through your actual practice as they said, simultaneously, and that is very valid. Thank you. And Niamh, uh, before you undertook the course, what were your expectations and how, how did it uh, turn out in the end for you? My expectations, Leo, before I took the course was that um, obviously there'd be a flow and a structure um, and that we'd be given an overview of the different tools and techniques. Afterwards, it's I suppose it's much more um, that basically it's certainly at the moment, I feel for a lot of teachers around the country, there's a lot of there's a lot of policies and procedures. So the course has managed to put the theorists policies and procedures um, present in posters, then seeing other teachers, how they went about it, certainly brought the whole lot together because it re the course really got you to think about how the learner is the organization set up um, to geared towards digital capabilities. And the idea that you could have a class that you're teaching the same all the time, that not the same tool doesn't always best fit, that you have to be creative, I suppose. And, and I certainly second what Dave said there about other colleagues. It's amazing the way other people, the way they presented tools and different things, a great learning curve. It, 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 as Dave said, and, and it's not just direct learning, but the opportunity to to meet with others and to share the uh, different approaches that other colleagues have done in terms of using technology for their teaching. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and just, I mean, I'll start Dave maybe, but any of you can join in about, um, sometimes, you know, something surprises people when they're on a course and it might be that something that they thought was more difficult turns out to be easier or the reverse or something like that. But I'm very interested in in surprises, uh, you know, for courses um, because I think it always helps us get a good sense of the experience of the course. Dave, was there any parts of the course that surprised you? Um, well, I suppose having, you know, when you're creating your own teaching tools using different technologies, you're not creating it to a rubric yeah whereas now we're trying to you know create the tool based on the learning outcomes so we do have a you know something that we have to keep an eye on and keep track on whereas ordinarily i would have just put something together within a half an hour yeah 
is something like a structure that you can use yeah um for so many different situations yeah mm. no it, it has proved very beneficial because now when i'm creating a lesson i go back almost without thinking to the rubric in my mind and going well how can this be shared yeah how is it going to benefit the different um parties that will be experiencing it and Niamh and Monica, did you have any aspects of the course that surprised you or had you had the same experience with using rubrics or whatever? For me, it was um, the, the, the freedom that was provided to us to carry out our assignments and the um, encouragement of our own individual um perceptions and understanding and <clears throat> creating our own design and yet keeping to the rubric and it's something that i've become a bit of a copycat because i've been using this style uh, with my own students and so uh, namely creating a case study i have found the benefit of that so I was impressed uh, about that because before I started the course, in my mind, I thought that I would be doing the typical essay that one would do in right. universities. And uh, I was kind of preparing myself for that, um, thinking, oh, well, I will dedicate a lot of time and research. And while there is a lot of research in this, it's quite incredible the way that you can uh, do all the reading and all of the research and then put all of that together in the format of a poster. Um, and I think it's very powerful the way in the style in which we were taught with keeping our own personalities and giving our own individual uh, ways of doing it. I loved it. I, I have to say that's, that's really nice for me to hear because I, I remember sitting in, in workshops, you, you know, two years ago and we were debating the very points that you're making here, which is that how, how can we provide something when the, the the teaching population in further education is so diverse hmm. and um, and that people come come at it from so many different ways and it was that we realized that there was there's a great deal of experience and talent already with you and that we were trying to find ways of harnessing it or releasing it or allowing each of you to express your own teaching creativity through the poster presentations. Neve, how did you find it from, a, from that perspective? Um, what most surprised me, um, Leo, it's gas, is actually from within our own group presentations, there's one or two teachers, they teach maths up the country. And who would have known that maths could be so much fun from, <laughs> I, from the tools they picked. It's, it's amazing what they've done and how effective and that you'd look in that you'd love to be a student in that particular class because it's just amazing the second thing is that this year to date i've gained a lot of confidence in using different tools to the point one or two groups were like i reckon they dreaded coming online because what new tool had i today <laughs> to try out so it's to kind of maybe not overuse the tools as well so that's kind of yeah. the surprises i had i've i've often noticed that that the the, the workload for the students increases yeah. when you're using a lot of the digital tools because they have to participate. Um, and that's great, it's great yeah. for learning, but but you know, the, the idea that they can like uh, uh, sit quietly at the back and, and stay out of yeah. uh, uh, contact, that doesn't seem to happen in a lot of these uh, technology classroom environments. And certainly, Leo, it's kind of bringing about um, that what I've discovered this year, it's amazing that you could have learners in a group that are very shy, reserved in the group. When they come online, it's a different form of a confidence. They become very confident. So I think that's important as well. There's a positive in it. Yeah, yeah I agree. Uh, just go back to you, Dave. The, the, did the course or any aspects of the course um, have any impact on your on your practice as a teacher? Um, well, I suppose it, it, it has saved me time. Um, I've become, I think, I, I think more finely tuned as a teacher. I'm very selective about the type of tools that I'm using um, because I think I've, I've recognised now the tools that will get the most out of my learners, my particular learners. Yes, how to engage them more. 
Um, and it's surprising, it's not the, the more high-end tools that you'd imagine, it's, it's the basic tools that have been at our disposal for quite a long time. Um, um, you know, we have this perception that our learners are all digitally capable because they're always glued to their phones. Yeah. It's not the fact, we, we have to develop that simple digital skill that they have using their phones. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting. Um, that, that we make that assumption that they're all going to be somehow empowered, but the, it's, it's almost the skills that we think we need most are, you know, as the technology skills probably are easy enough to acquire. It's the skills of teaching with technology. Um, yeah, yeah. And, you know, people sometimes say technology enhanced learning, but I think, you know, what we overlook is technology enhanced teaching. Good technology in the hands of great teachers. Yes, yeah. Um, Monica, in terms of your practice, did it change aspects of your practice? Or? Hugely, definitely. Yeah. I, I had at three levels, first of all, my own um, way of doing things and the understanding much with a much greater spectrum of what teaching and learning is all about. <clears throat> encouraging collaboration, encouraging sharing, um, interaction, ha having the students participate in content creation, all sorts of things that I would never have uh, envisaged before because I come from the point of view of being a teacher that has a, a, a handout, gives the handout, talks to the class for 40 minutes and off they go, five minutes for questions. And that whole thing is gone, it's changed, thank God. Um, for the learner's point of view, um, tremendous positive uh, results. They were very engaging. Initially in September, they were afraid that seeing that what I teach is so practical, they were afraid uh, that they were gonna have to um, leave the course because how can you <clears throat> teach a, a practical course in front of a computer. Well, I proved I proved uh, um, that it was possible and it could be very enjoyable, and it was. So they are now graduates, happy graduates, and they've learned loads thanks to the enhanced technology. At teachers' level, my colleagues have been able to compare some of the things I was doing. I implemented uh, <clears throat> a few techniques that were very meaningful, and they saw it and they felt the benefit uh, of it. And I also am lucky to say that I am part of a group in my college where I'm um, part of the management, lead, the, the leadership team, and I was able to bring in to their attention of management and, and, and all of the team, the urgent need of bringing uh, um, a, a, a time, a located time where um, we would investigate the digital capabilities of the learners so that the problem that Dave was referring to in relation to um, having the learners dedicating too much time to learn the technologies, that, that we could solve that problem from the very early stages um, and how important it is to, to change the way in which we do things. Thank you. Niamh, um, in terms of transforming or changing aspects of, of your teaching, has it had an impact? Um, I suppose it's really made me think about the, the tool that's best fit for a group you're teaching. A good example of that is, Leo, that in an evening time, I teach very heavy theory. And therefore, that requires maybe a little less digital tool, um, but maybe like the use of Quizlet. And then, for example, if I do the flip side of that, um, teaching work experience or PPD, confidence, communications, you could be using... Um, presentations or different elements. Also, um, I know you can be creative, but how one tool is just as effective to get the message across to students. The other thing is, um, it's the use, it made me think about, I suppose, the use of resources within our own E2B. And as Dave mentioned, um, the need for collaboration, definitely, across the board as well, with all the other E2Bs more than ever. Thanks. Um Dave, in terms of, um, you know, there might be people watching this and they're thinking about doing this course and they're probably thinking about the, 
the challenges that they might face. It might be the challenges of that, you know, may, maybe to do with the technology, having the time to devote to the course or the level of intensity or even aspects of the course that people might find difficult. Um, have you any advice you'd give to people who are considering a course like this? I would definitely do it. I, I would do it all again. Um, and I'm sure in time we're going to have to do it all again because of mm. the pace technology is yeah. developing at. It is manageable and the lectures on the course are, they're there all the time for you. Well, you. not all the time, but do you know if, you, if you've ever got an issue or a yeah. question, you can email them and they'll be back to you in a timely fashion, let's say. Thanks. Um, and it is enjoyable and I think like, I don't know if it was our group in particular, but we seem to have great crack uh, yeah. in, in, the, in the lectures. It's, it's, where we, it's where we've known each other for years, you yeah. know, to carry on. Um, but that's made it a more enjoyable experience. Yeah, jump in, Neve or Monica, in terms of advice and uh, might pick up, actually, could I just pick up on that point there? Because I've experienced that over the years um, with teachers when they, when they grapple with technology for the first time, it's like there's, there might be a little bit of um, feel the fear and do it anyway. But there's there's a, there's a, another aspect of it when you, when it works and it works most of the time when you put it, uh, sufficient preparation into it. It's, it's extremely enjoyable. You, you, everyone gets a buzz out of it. You get a buzz. The teachers, the, your colleagues get a buzz, and the students get a buzz. I, I don't know if that's been your experience as well. Like. Monica? I, I think that uh, I definitely one of the things that normally comes to, to mind uh, when embracing something like this is fear. And I would say it, that would be the highlight of my advice. Do not be afraid. It's, it's um, you know, technology for some reason, we seem to put it in that box of fear. And, what the, you know, we would say, I'm not very tech. And look, I came in with a shovel on my Wellingtons and if I could do it, um, anybody can do it. You don't have to be very tech. It's a very gentle, it's kind of unfolded in a very gentle and nice way. <clears throat> so it's good to break that ice of the fear. Um, it's time invested, but it's also that time that you invest is also time safe because what you're going to learn is going to in future, in your future practice, is going to save you time. You're going to have your lovely content packed in together in a very nicely stored way and <clears throat> you're going to be able to, you know, manipulate it in very beautiful ways. And so time in invested is time saved. And basically, it's gentle from the point of view that you're one week on and one week off in terms of directed activities happen uh, in one week. And then when you are uh, with more contact, it's a very gentle couple of hours. And as, as uh, Neve and Dave said, um, it's the, you know, the enjoyment of meeting other uh, like minded people and suddenly becoming a student yourself so that you can actually put yourself in their feet of your own students. Uh, definitely, I would say to anybody, go for it. Great. Neve, any advice? Yeah, I think definitely same as um, Monica and Dave, go for it. definitely a few pointers. It's for any level, as Monica just said there, definitely, absolutely. Um, what I loved was because like the lads, I suppose, and like everybody, our own life is jam packed. The timetable was very manageable and also um, assessments, very interesting, very interesting. And you'd look forward to, we have another one tomorrow, in fact, but You'd look forward to other people's posters to see what they're going to use in there, and you learn a lot from others, definitely. Thank you. Um, I have to say, I really enjoyed having the conversation with all three of you and uh, experiencing a bit of the enthusiasm and, and the buzz that you've got from your participation on the course. So I'm very proud of that. And uh, thank, you, thank you for your kind comments about the, the lectures and about the structure of the programme in NCI. and, and the, the theorist in me can't um, can't be suppressed completely. I I, I really feel that that um, mention of um, you know a, a a sense of a sense of fulfilment, a sense of enjoyment associated with learning is is really important yeah. because I think for too long we've we felt that learning must be difficult mm. um, and it must involve uh, you know high pressure and 
And what I think happens in some of the um, technology mediated uh, classroom environments is that there's a bit of chaos in there and there's a bit of control going back to the students and everybody's co-producing their learning. Yeah. And, and and people then feel if it's that easy and that enjoyable, how could it be effective? But amazingly, it's mm -hmm. dramatically effective in yeah. terms of learning outcomes and in terms of the efficiency of teaching and things like that. So I think your comments bear that out. And I think that's something mm -hmm. always to keep to the forefront that teaching can be so much fun and enjoyment as well as I know we put a lot of our professional energy into it as well. Um, Thank you. Thank you all for your, 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 your contributions.